You're listening to Switched On Australia, the podcast that tracks the opportunities and challenges of electrifying everything, everywhere. Switched On is brought to you by the publishers of Renew Economy, Australia's best informed, most read website focusing on the green energy transition and is supported by Boundless Earth, using philanthropy, investment and direct advocacy to help Australia become a global force in a decarbonised world. Hello and welcome to the latest Switched On Australia podcast. I'm Anne Delaney. Great you could join me. The ACT is leading the nation when it comes to emissions reduction and electrification. They've committed to an all-electric future and phasing out fossil fuel gas by 2045. And they're the first jurisdiction in Australia to be powered entirely by renewable energy, even though there are no renewable energy plants in the ACT. They've done that by constructing several wind farms in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia over the last decade. As a result, power bills are falling in the ACT while they're soaring everywhere else. And in landmark legislation, the ACT was also the first state or territory to ban new gas connections in households and businesses. No new gas connections will be possible from November this year. Victoria is the only other state to announce bans. Whilst community support for the transition has been high in the ACT, it's largely been the government that has driven the decarbonisation agenda so far. However, the next stage of the transition, electrifying the whole of the ACT, will depend on what the community does. With 60% of the ACT's emissions now coming from transport and another 22% coming from fossil fuel gas, which is largely used in homes, ACT householders will be essential players in the territory's decarbonisation and electrification. To discuss the ACT's electrification journey, I'm joined today by the ACT Minister for Energy, Shane Rattenbury, who's also the leader of the ACT Greens in a coalition government with the Labor Party. I started my discussion with Minister Rattenbury by asking him to describe how fossil fuel gas is currently used in the Territory. It's a significant baseline. I mean, as your listeners will know, Canberra does not have a big industrial uh, base here. Uh, So the key use of gas in the city is for uh, space heating, essentially, and then for households, also hot water and cooking. Uh, We've got around probably two-thirds or so of the households in the ACT are connected to the gas network. You know, it's been a big thing here for a long time, and for a long time our community was told that gas was the cheap and clean alternative to using electricity, which was true to some extent when our electricity was coming from uh, black and brown coal-fired power stations. Uh, That was true. But, of course, having now gone to 100% renewable electricity, gas, fossil fuel gas, is simply another fossil fuel in our system that we need to eliminate if we are going to achieve our goal of net zero emissions. Mm. Now, uh, just to jump well ahead, as you said, by 2045, you're planning for the ACT to reach net zero emissions, uh, to be largely fully electrified. How do you want the ACT's energy use to look like then? Yeah, I mean, for me, an important part of having these long term goals is you have got time to work on it. And we need to gradually transition all the different things across to essentially being an electrified city. We released a position paper last year that indicated that uh, we want to transition from fossil fuels across to electrification uh, and that will obviously be a key pathway for cutting emissions. There are going to be those hard to deal with sectors uh, and I think what we need to do is deal with the easy things first and work our way through the list as we eliminate the various sources of fossil fuel use in the Territory. As part of the strategy, by the end of this year, you're, you are mandating that there'll be no new gas connections in the ACT. Mm. How important is it to stop new gas connections? What percentage of new builds are actually currently connecting to the gas? Well, most new builds are currently connecting to gas, and I think this is the easiest step you can take is to stop making the problem worse. We already have our first all-electric suburb here in the ACT, so we know it's possible to do it. And so the easiest thing to do is to stop making the problem worse by and stop putting in what will become obsolete infrastructure by rolling out new gas pipelines. Uh, So that's why we're moving to make this shift reasonably soon. Uh, We want to stop that expansion of the gas network and then we can start focusing on the legacy projects, which we'll have to gradually work our way through. And they're going to take a hell of a lot longer, aren't they? 
They are indeed. And so, the, you know, the easiest thing is to start now. And I think this is really important from a consumer point of view as well. We don't want householders building a new home today with a you know, gas hot water system, gas heating, gas cooking in an environment in which we're looking to phase gas out because they'll just then be left with a more expensive retrofit later on. The best thing we can do for householders at this point, having taken the decision to electrify the city, is to ensure that they are putting the infrastructure today that they need in the future. Mm. And what, what impact has the simple announcement of saying that you'll be banning new gas connections, one on the gas industry and, and two on your energy users? I think our Sydney Canberra, Canberra residents really understand this. We did a, a survey last year and the feedback was really quite positive. The majority of people uh, understood and were aware of the environmental impacts of gas and consider that electricity is a better energy source for the environment. They understand that we need to act on climate change. Uh, and they certainly did identify cost, initial cost being a barrier, but also identified that just having the knowledge to change over was a really significant thing. Uh, so we've got strong community support. Uh, there is some resistance. We have seen the, uh, the plumbers and gas fitters particularly are exercised by this changeover. They have been probably the most vocal critics of this transition. And, and tell me what their resistance is. Look, obviously they're concerned about their job security and that is an absolutely fair position. For me, one of the really important parts of that is we are committed to a just transition process. And so taking a decision now and announcing that we're going to phase gas out by 2045, to me, very much sits in that notion of a just transition. We're being really clear where we're going. We're giving people plenty of time to prepare to make the transition in the most cost-effective way. Uh, and it also provides an opportunity for those working in the sector to think about their own futures. Now, our modelling actually shows that there's going to be a significant amount of demand for gas fitters in the next few years. There's going to actually be more work yes. uh, during, the, during the decommissioning process. So in the short term, uh, there's going to be plenty of work. We're, we're really looking at a 10, 15, 20-year horizon for people working at industry in particular. Yeah, you're definitely going to need gas fitters to do the dis disconnecting, but you're also going to need a hell of a lot of more electricians to be mm, actually doing mm. the the new builds, new connections, etc. And, and uh, I'm not aware of what the situation is in, in the ACT, but certainly where I am and in other states of Australia, it, it's hard to get an electrician. What are you doing about the, the workforce issues that are going to arise as we transition off the gas and onto, the, onto more electricity? No, it's a really good point. And I think this is something that's been discussed by energy ministers at a national level. Uh, and it's an issue we're thinking about locally. We will not have enough electricians or people who work in this field in the broader thing, if you think about transmissions lines and all the other things we need to do, we simply don't have enough skilled staff. Our response locally is to work with our TAFE to make sure that we are getting the right courses and enough space in those courses to, so the training opportunity is available for people. Mm. What you're kind of pointing to is the need for a big plan <laughs> Indeed, <laughs> to do this properly. There are so many sectors that have to be involved in terms of the, the jobs that are created, the jobs that need to change, the community that needs to go along with you, leadership, how you deal with backlash from the gas industry. It, it, you need a massive plan. Would that be your advice to other states who are trying to do this? I don't think you, you shouldn't be put off by needing to think you've got to have a massive plan. You know, the approach we've taken in the ACT is to set the goal and to be very clear about it so that we know we've got to start making the transition. That in itself starts to get people thinking. It starts to socialise the ideas and it does allow people to plan ahead. We are now in the process of writing that detailed plan. We're calling it an integrated energy plan to help us guide the transition. We, know, we now know the journey. We know where we need to get to. If you think about it as a book, perhaps, we've now got to write the more detailed chapters. Uh, and so that's the work we're doing. And, you know, some of these questions, there aren't clear answers for them yet. But in knowing where we need to get to, we can certainly take the early steps. And so that's where you know, the first and early step is to stop new gas connections. Beyond that, we need to start planning. We're seeing many households are already making the transition themselves. Uh, that is something that the community has already responded to. You know, that classic group of early adopters are getting into it, people who are particularly environmentally conscious or 
want to be involved or see an economic opportunity. You know, when they're renovating their house, they mm. know it's cheaper to run an all electric household and they're making that choice at the time. Uh, and then we'll need to start to work through the more difficult areas, uh, areas where we've got low income households, apartment buildings, a different, uh, different industry sectors. You know, these are the sort of things that are going to take more time to work through. You've raised some major impediments already, and so far your renewable energy transition has been, it has been led by government. The fact that mm. you've managed to convert your grid to run on renewable energy. But getting off gas and electrifying everything is a little bit different. For some, it's going to be a big move. There's the upfront expense of electrifying mm. down to simply people love cooking with gas, for instance. If the community doesn't embrace the electrification change, it's not going to work, is it? it look, it's a really good question. There's a lot in the, the comments you just made. I think when we did the shift to renewable electricity, it very much was a government exercise. We just did it on behalf of the community. Now, the community has been very supportive of that and the cost of it has been actually less than we originally predicted. So that's gone quite smoothly, mm -hmm. but that was government just doing it. You are right to identify that in the remaining sectors of greenhouse gas emissions we have now, we really have to shift from pure government action to significant community engagement. We really need everybody else to be involved now. That said, I think there is a really clear role for government. The first part of that role is actually setting the policy framework. And you know that's saying we have struggled with in Australia in recent years. And certainly, you know, for me, a really important part of the theory of change is if We've set the clear goals. We know where we're going. Then people can start to participate. Uh, and that's saying we're doing I think there's also a role for government leadership. For example, in the ACT, we've now built the last three new schools that we have built have been all electric. Uh, our last new office government building is all electric. All new public housing that we're building is all electric. And we're building the Southern Hemisphere's first all electric hospital. Uh, so in doing these projects, we are both showing, I think, a a directional leadership, but also creating the opportunities for industry so that we start to build the industry capability because there's real projects out there with real money in them that industry can start to work on and that starts to create your skill base. Going back to our earlier mm. point, you, you know, you're actually building the industry that will do the work that ultimately the rest of the community will need to do. Mm. And just focusing on, on householders just mm. for a minute, Cost is a major factor for a lot of people. Yes, the ACT probably has, you know, a higher level of income amongst most of the householders than some of the other states. But cost is going to be an impediment for, for some people. Does it simply come down to the government providing some finance, some incentives, some loans, etc.? How, how important are those financial incentives from government? I think, again, the role of government needs to be really carefully thought through on this. And I think the specific role for government in the context of particularly a just transition is to focus on the low-income households. As I talked about earlier, we've got households already transitioning across because they're doing a major renovation and that's when they're putting in electric devices. We're running a campaign now that says, make your next choice electric. I'm really trying to convey that idea to the community that uh, this is the moment to make the changeover. But we're also being very clear. You know, if you think about a household, say you've got all three devices, hot water, uh, heating and cooking. They're not all going to break down at the same time. These devices generally have a 20, 25-year life on them. So my advice to the community is if your heating system breaks down next year, don't get another gas one, change over then. And in terms of households having to face the cost, they've already faced that cost of having to if their gas system breaks down tomorrow, they have to put a new heating system in tomorrow. Uh, they're already mm. facing that cost. And so the question is, make sure you don't then invest in something that's going to become obsolete. One of the interesting questions is, is there a price premium? And where there is a price premium, perhaps that's the role for government to play because uh, you know, that's, uh, that's the gap that needs to be solved. Because the reality is when our gas hot water systems, for instance, go, we only have to have a couple of cold showers yes. and we're ready to take pretty much anything. <laughs> well, indeed. And this is where we need to work really carefully with the industry as well because I think uh, you know, I've had anecdotal reports where people say, well, I, I asked the plumber to come around, I need a new hot water system. And they turn up and said, oh, don't get one of those heat pumps. I, you know, they're not reliable and they have mm. all sorts of theories on it. And so you know, I have heard the anecdotes of people being actively encouraged to stick with gas. And I think that's because what that's what people are used to. And so there's a, a role there to work with the industry as well to make sure that 
when you call up saying, my hot water's gone and I'm having cold showers and I can't bear it, they're ready to go with a heat pump and that you are able to make that transition easily and quickly. What are you going to do to ensure that people don't get left behind connected to overpriced gas in the future? This is a significant issue and I know that Claire Savage, as the head of the Australian Energy Regulator, has been talking about this as well and it's certainly something we are contemplating. We do not have an answer for it yet, but we know that it is is an issue we need to address. You will have seen the latest determination in Victoria where they have allowed for a accelerated depreciation of the gas network infrastructure. Uh, and similarly, we're now seeing an adjustment around uh, the issue of abolishment of your gas connection. Uh, you might have picked this one up where the cost to abolish, depending on where you are, is $800 to $1,000. If you simply close your gas account, it's about 100 bucks. And so what we've seen in the ACT is we've got a lot of households who've worked this out and they're simply closing their gas account but leaving a live gas connection you know, running through their yard, essentially. And certainly yeah. the AER is very concerned about this from a safety point of view. So these are, this is an example of some of the big issues that we're going to face. Well, what are you encouraging people to do? Because uh, some of the reading uh, suggested that you actually want the consumers to pay the 800 bucks, I think it is, in the ACT to disconnect completely. Yeah, look, obviously from a, a safety point of view, that is ideal, but I think it's very reasonable for people to look at it and make a pretty rational decision that they're just going to, uh, to disconnect their gas account. And that's where, again, I think there's a role for government working with the regulators like the AER to think about what is the best way to do this? And I don't think anybody knows the answer to this yet, but we've, you know, the sort of examples that are around are, well, if you've got an entire cul-de-sac, say, are you better off actually just capping off the gas main at the top of the cul-de-sac rather than going yeah. around doing each individual house? Is that more cost-effective? And these are the issues that governments and regulators are going to have to work through fairly quickly as we think about how this transition will uh, roll out. And also the question of who should pay for it. Why, why should it be left up to the individual consumer? Why, why shouldn't the, the gas industry be made to pay? Well, indeed, these are the, the sort of questions we're going to have to think about. Is it for the consumer, is it for the industry, or is it for government to pay for these transitions? And uh, these questions are unresolved at the moment. I was wondering, have you had much of a backlash from the gas industry so far to the announcements that you've made? Not here in the ACT. I haven't actually seen any of the folks from the gas industry for a while. I'm not sure if they've given up on the ACT, but um, I think that they've really been quite muted. It's really, we've seen the main commentary coming from our local plumbing sector. If you want everybody to disconnect from the, the gas infrastructure, the pipelines, what are you going to do with the pipelines afterwards? Well, these are also good questions. And, you know, this is the view that's been put by plumbers and gas fitters in the ACT, for example, is that we should consider uh, piping hydrogen through those lines as an alternative gas supply. Uh, we've certainly had advice that it is more cost effective to electrify the city. Uh, that would be hydrogen or, or biogas, you mean? Yes, something you say along alternatives. those lines. Yes, yeah. yes, some sort of uh, zero emission gas in the future. Uh, but the advice we've had is that it's far more cost effective to electrify. So that means we are going to have to think about how we use the gas network. Now, I do see a role for alternative gases, whether it's hydrogen or biogases or similar, in niche applications in the ACT. That might be, for example, that our industrial areas continue to maintain some sort of gas network because of the particular applications you need for certain industrial practices. Uh, and so you could use the underground network as a, as a storage capability for a smaller network of of a gas usage like that. And again, that's the work that's still being thought about. And there could be safety issues involved with that too, couldn't there? Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is nobody anywhere has worked out how to do this yet. So for, as, and this is one of the challenges of being a jurisdiction that, that is at the forefront. Uh, there are a lot of questions coming up for which not all of the answers exist yet. But I think in starting the process and starting to work through it, we're very much taking that approach that we are dealing with the things we can deal with now and we are starting to think about the issues we'll need to deal with in the future. It sounds like you guys are a little bit ahead of the other states of Australia. It sounds like you're, you're going to be test pigs for this. There is going to be a certain amount of that going on. I think you know, the ACT is very well placed for that. We've got a community that is very much on board for this transition. We are you know, a small city. 
now at sort of 450,000 people, but we're also big enough that the scale of working some of these out is some of these issues is very useful for others to examine. And so, you know, we'll work very closely with all of those national agencies like ARENA, like the Australian Energy Regulator, to think through these questions. And we need to be thinking ahead as far as we can to make sure that we are managing issues of fairness and equity, uh, economic efficiency. But not knowing all the answers now is not a reason not to start. We have to mm. start on this transition. The climate imperative is clear that we have to start phasing out these fossil fuels. Uh, and you know, the idea of having long-term plans enables us to do it in a more orderly way. Yeah, just focusing on one of those issues of a just transition, and that is renters. Mm. How are you going to get landlords to change? Well, we've just uh, been thinking about that issue in a different context. We recently put in place new regulations which mandate minimum energy performance standards for rental properties. Mm -hmm. We have found that in the ACT with our quite cold winters and pretty hot summers, you know, so many of our tenants live in homes that are poorly insulated, they're freezing cold in winter, they're way too hot in summer, they have high energy bills and they're just not comfortable to live in. And it's a classic market failure. You know, people often talk about that split incentive, the idea that the landlord, of course, has to pay for the insulation and the ten tenant gets the benefit. Uh, and that is a problem that no one's worked out how to solve. And so I think the answer there is it's appropriate for the government to step in and regulate that. And we are now requiring landlords to put in place a minimum R5 ceiling insulation. And this will deliver significant benefits. And it may be, coming back to the gas issue, that is the approach we will need to take down the line with gas as well. Standards seem to be something that the government can can hold out for small investors and for industry to rise to the occasion by establishing building standards, for instance. That's mm. a really good way to go. Yeah, because it, it creates industry change, it creates industry capability, people skill up. Again, there's a role for government through this requirement for a minimum insulation standard. We have made interest-free loans available to landlords. You know, we're not... Not, this is not an anti-landlord thing. We're conscious that there's a whole type, lots of different types of landlords out there. Some don't have the spare capital to put it in. But, of course, they, it is tax deductible for landlords. So something like an interest-free loan can be a really effective way of crossing over that threshold and enabling people to get it done whilst also being required to meet a particular standard. Now, the ACT has been trialling an all-electric suburb in uh, G Ginnandary, is it? Ginnandary, yes. Ginnandary, yes. <laughs> on the outskirts of, of Canberra, mm. where there's no gas and it's powered completely by renewable energy. And uh, Tell me a little bit about that pilot and how that's going and what, what you've learnt by doing a pilot like that. Look, it has been a really valuable experience. So it's, this is a joint venture between the ACT government and... Uh, a landowning company here in the Territory. Uh, early on, we took a decision to go all electric, and that was really interesting in itself because at the time, it was actually the law in the ACT that it was mandatory to roll out the gas network. Uh, it was one of a range of you know, standard services that should be rolled out, so electricity, gas, sewerage, water, all of these things that sit in the planning laws, and gas was actually part of it. So we had to create a special exemption at the beginning uh, to enable gin and dairy to not have the gas connected and we've come quite a long way from that of mandatory gas connections to moving to a point where we're going to stop gas connections. And that's only been about four or five years. So it's been quite a quick transition uh, from perhaps one extreme to the other. In terms of gin and dairy, what it's shown us is a couple of interesting things. Firstly, uh, it is a little more expensive up front. All of the homes out there have been built with uh, solar panels, all electric and a, and a battery. Uh, and so, you know, obviously there's a bit more upfront capital cost. Uh, but the annual energy savings are paying that back in a period of four or five years. So it's very cost effective in that sense. Uh, we've not had major complaints coming out of gin and dairy. The one cultural issue that has arisen, and it's one you touched on earlier, is people's love of cooking with gas. Yes. And we have, we have had some reports of people literally having gas bottles on their kitchen bench so they can cook with gas. Right. Which is, you know, I think... Some people would sort of think that's a bit, a bit of a worry from a safety point of view, but it does show you, I think, that actually gas is, uh, sorry, cooking with gas is perhaps the biggest cultural challenge we face in this whole transition. 
it's sort of like a gateway decision, I think, for some people. They, they, they want to hang on to the, the gas stove. So consequently, some people are even reluctant to change over everything else in the house if they're going to maintain a gas stove, for instance. That then becomes a really expensive gas cooking option, though, because you're paying your annual... <laughs> Well, you're paying your annual connection and usage fees yes. and then using actually a very small amount of gas. So you'd have to really love your gas cooking. And, you know, I've actually just put in an induction cooktop. Uh, there has been a few burnt things along the way. But, you know, I have to say induction is pretty impressive. And uh, once you start, once you learn to use it, it really is like having gas. Yeah. Tell me, you've, you've also modelled whether or not the ACT will be better off with a, a centralised energy system like we pretty much all have now, controlled by the big energy companies, or one that's more decentralised where energy users have greater control over their energy supply. W what did that find? Yeah, we are looking at a range of options because clearly in moving to an electrified city, we will need to think about the capability of the electricity network to support that the, you know going off all that gas and we, we do use quite a lot of gas in our city obviously creates a big energy load that needs to be met from somewhere else and so what we've been looking at is is it more cost effective with more decentralized uh, energy supply and, and certainly we believe that in both having obviously a lot of households connecting to solar having uh, batteries through the network uh, and those sort of measures we can avoid a significant amount of having to upgrade the network and so it does help reduce the cost of the overall transition. Now, we haven't even touched on transport. Mm, mm. Just remind us, what sort of issue you, the emissions from transport in the ACT? Yeah, as I said earlier, transport is now responsible for more than 60% of our emissions here in the Territory and it's one area that is under pressure. Like we see across Australia, transport emissions are probably growing rather than declining at this point. So what's the plan for transport? Do you have a plan? We do have a plan and it's um, a, bit, a bit different to the, the sort of household or the electrification model for getting off gas. I think with transport there is not a singular solution. We need to do a number of things. We need to electrify our existing fleet, transition across to zero emission vehicles. And actually, I should be clear, we do talk about zero emission vehicles because I think the, the jury is still out on what role hydrogen is going to play in in transport, uh, so we're trying to keep an open door on that. But it's also about other things. It's about improving our public transport network so that people have got an alternative to just the private motor vehicle, and also improving walking and cycling infrastructure. So really trying to think about how do we enable, enable people to get around the city easily in a zero emissions way. The ACT has actually got one of the highest uptakes of um, new electric vehicles, I understand. It's about, is it about one in five? Yeah, look, it's been rocketing along and we've put a series of incentives in place, including uh, zero stamp duty on electric vehicles. We've got two years of free registration and we've also got an interest-free loan of up to $15,000 to help people purchase the vehicles. Uh, we have seen a very significant uptake and as you touch on, uh, certainly for 2023 so far, so since January, uh, we've seen one in five new vehicles being registered in the ACT as electric vehicles. It's, a, it's an extraordinary uptake, uh, well ahead of anywhere else in Australia. And, you know, just as someone who drives around town, I'm certainly starting to see it on the roads. You're seeing more and more of these vehicles all of the time. Even though you've got those incentives, those financial incentives, it does come down to the fact that a lot of Canberrians have a high disposal income to be able to afford them. Look, I certainly think that is assisting the transition. And I, this is where... Talking about these kind of transitions, you need to think in a more nuanced way than just everybody's going to do things the same way. Mm. Right now, there are a lot of people right across Australia who are spending sixty to eighty thousand dollars on a car. Now, that's a lot of money for a lot of people, but there are people who buy that. And so, when people say, "Oh, electric vehicles are too expensive," let's be real about the fact that people are spending that much money on a petrol vehicle today. And again, my advice would be: Why are you buying a petrol vehicle? That is not the future. I think you then need to compare that to people who possibly never buy a brand new car in their life. They will always get secondhand vehicles. That group is much harder. It's going to take longer to transition them across to the electric vehicle uh, revolution. And that is, you know, I think that's a significant equity issue. Uh, but that's saying we need, again, where I think government has a particular role to play. But once the second-hand market in EVs revs up, so to speak, that hopefully will open up a, a whole new sector to be able to use EVs. 
That's right, and that's where I think the people who can afford them should be buying EVs today because that will help boost the market. It will create a pool of second-hand vehicles. Again, as government, we've taken a role in that where uh, several years ago we took a decision that for our fleet we would not get any new internal combustion engines. Uh, and so we now, you know, as those vehicles go through the leasing cycle, they will come out as second-hand vehicles that will be available to more people. And you know, that, has cre- that in itself creates, uh, obviously, the opportunities to grow the fleet and to create more vehicles at a lower price for more people. As an EV driver, one of the things I've noticed, particularly over the last year, is getting access to some of the public charging stations. Mm. How are you going with rolling out charging stations in the ACT? Yeah, I think we're probably a little behind. But the, the rate of uptake we've seen, we, we do need to catch up. But we've got programs now we've committed to having 180 installed charging stations installed across the city by 2025. Uh, we did a tender last year that rolled out the first 50 of those. Uh, and we're also having to think about in that context, how are people who live in apartments going to charge their electric vehicles? That's certainly looming as a key barrier uh, because obviously retrofitting into older apartment buildings is both technically challenging and more expensive. We've been looking overseas at the experience in you know, places like Norway, of course, where they have a far greater penetration of electric vehicles and less people living in semi-detached homes as well. And so it provides some good thinking. And our view is that we do need to get a good supply of public charging infrastructure available because in many ways it'll be easier to provide public charging for people who live in apartments rather than necessarily retrofitting into all of the buildings. Mm. Because that, that European model is when you go out to go to the gym or do your shopping or have coffee with your friend, you, you know, if you can get a charge then and you're out for an hour or two, that's a perfectly good time to charge as opposed to potentially having to re- retrofit it into everybody's apartment building. So this is the sort of thinking we're trying to do about how do we make it easy for people, break down some barriers and do it in a cost-effective way. As the minister in the ACT for all of this, how, how much do you look overseas to see what has been happening? Because they've been moving at a much faster pace than us here in Australia. Indeed, certainly in Australia, you know, a lot of these things were at the front edge. And so we are having to look overseas as much as we can because questions are coming up that no one else in Australia knows the answers to. And we, you know, I'm a great fan of not needing to reinvent the wheel. If someone's done something that's worked, I'm happy just to copy it. And so we're very keen to, you know, we are looking at those overseas experiences. And just a final question, Minister, how confident are you that you're going to get to net zero by 2045? I'm quite confident. You know, we've seen quick take up already by many in our community of uh, the sort of transition issues that we've been talking about in this discussion today. That said, there are going to be some hard nuts to crack as we move our way through this. And so, you know, I think we'll get off to a good start. We'll probably hit a few speed bumps, but I'm pretty confident we can do it by 2045. The innovation we're seeing both in Australia and around the world, the technological change and the community's understanding that we need to tackle climate change, all of those factors I think will combine into substantial movement over the next decade or so. Shane Rattenbury, thanks very much for joining the Switched On podcast today. Thank you. And Shane Rattenbury is the Minister for Energy and Climate Change in the ACT. One of the issues the Minister briefly touched on in our discussion was minimum energy efficiency standards for rental properties. This is seen as one of the ways to ensure renters can also share in the benefits of electrification. If you'd like to know more about some of the issues for renters getting off gas and electrifying, you might be interested in an article we've posted this week on the Switched On website called What About the Renters? On our next Switched On podcast, I'll be talking to the CEO of a company that has set itself up as a one-stop shop for electrification. They're a great example of what many people are saying we will need if we are going to roll out electrification at scale across Australia. I hope you can join me then. Take care. I'm Anne Delaney. See you next time.